Welcome, people of the planet Earth. Today, my guest is Benjamin Cowan, host of Into the Cryptoverse, which provides high quality cryptocurrency education to those who want to dive deeper into the metrics that are driving the market. He approaches cryptocurrency from a practical perspective and uses his science, engineering, and programmatic background to package these metrics in an easily digestible way. And now, Here's my conversation with Benjamin Cowan. Appreciate you uh, for joining me today. Um, you know, it's an interesting time to, to, to be speaking with you. You know, <laughs> I, I guess I should rewind a, a little bit and say, you know, I'm not long into, into crypto. I kind of started uh, probably getting into it just, you know, three or four years ago when probably a lot of people did, to be quite honest. It's not like I was an early adopter or anything. But it's something that intrigues me for, um, you know, initially it really intrigued me as a technology and a way to have independence from fi other financial systems controlled by governments and things like that. Um, but as I've seen recently in the last few uh, days, in fact, it seems like the government's getting more involved in crypto. So it seems like a great time to have you on. So I, I appreciate you making the time. Sure. It's no problem. Pleasure to be here to talk to you about crypto and answer any questions you might have. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I, I wanted to kind of get some background on you, because when I started trying to learn about crypto, uh, I hate this term, the crypto bro term. Right. But what I encountered was that there's a lot of people at that time. I think the big push at the time was Bitcoin's going to three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. It's no doubt by the end of the year, you know, there was a lot of of hype and it felt like most of the people putting out information about uh, crypto were really just hyping stuff and there wasn't a lot of like cut and dry information like this is really what it is and it's one of the things when i found you i really appreciated was the fact that it wasn't a bunch of uh you know superficial fluff it was you know this is the, the this analysis of it and it was very informative so I wanted to start off a little bit by asking you what led you to that sort of approach uh, to breaking down crypto and delivering the information in, in that way? Yeah, I would say that probably the biggest reason is just because I've been burned in crypto so many times. Um, yeah, I think like once you go through a full cycle, you kind of realize just how much fluff there is and and how all these price predictions are are essentially meaningless. You know, no one no one really knows exactly how high or how low Bitcoin's going to go. Um, at any given point. And you're, you're always going to have people throwing out price predictions. And I, I mean, I, I do put out some myself, you know, occasionally, but there is an element of, you know, every single cycle, we do see some form of diminishing returns with the price of Bitcoin. And, and that was why, you know, 300K seemed far too optimistic um, for this cycle. I mean, a 300K Bitcoin would have basically been the same type of returns that we had seen the cycle before when the market cap was much lower. And we know that it's, easier to move the market cap when it's lower. That's why people like the altcoin market is because they can they have a lot more volatility. They can go up they can go up really quickly. They can also go down really quickly too because there's also just not as much liquidity there and they're more speculative than than Bitcoin. But yeah, I mean long story short, the reason I take this approach is um you know, I've been burned a couple of times myself in crypto and I mean even every every new cycle you're always going to get burned in some way. <laughs> um but it certainly takes one full cycle, I think, to really appreciate all the nuances of the cryptoverse and, you know, when Bitcoin runs, when does the altcoin market run? When is there more of like a flight to safety back to, to say, Bitcoin versus when is it, you know, when do people go back to, to the altcoin market? And, you know, so I, I take a really risk averse approach. It, um, it can often be... Uh, it, it can, it's funny because, you know, taking the more risk averse approach, anytime we get a, a crazy short term pump, uh, it's, it's easy to sort of point and laugh, but I also know, you know, if, if things go up really quickly, they can go down really quickly. And, and what's more important, I think, is to sort of try to minimize your risk when navigating crypto while also, I mean, also trying to, you know, trying to figure out what positions actually make sense, because if you're interested in crypto, then, you know, you want to establish positions in some projects at, at certain points, but you don't just want to bet the family farm 
you know, just because you saw a Reddit thread that week telling you that something was going to go to the moon. So uh, it's basically just like seeing the same stuff one cycle after another and trying to inform people, hey, like this happened last time as well. It's probably going to happen again. And, and let's try to not fall for the same things. I've, I've noticed one of the things that you talk about a lot and I, I've noticed it is that, um, you know, Bitcoin seems to go inverse of the altcoins. What is what are the market factors that that drive that? Is it just the trading between the altcoins and the bitcoins that drive that that shift? So there's different phases to the cycle. So I, I think right now we're in the phase where the dominance of Bitcoin is is on the rise, you know, a lot, and it has been going up quite quickly uh, just over the last few months. The dominance, including stable coins is I believe it's right right, right, right around 46% or so, 46, 47%, not including stables, it's already over 50%. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of cyclical behavior to it. And, and what happens is, is, you know, when there's a lot of, when there's access to cheap liquidity, uh, when we have loose monetary conditions, courtesy of the Federal Reserve, people are more likely to, to make more speculative plays in the altcoin market. Um, but again, the altcoin market is highly speculative. And and oftentimes the you know the coins that people are are sort of betting on don't really provide much utility. There are some I think that do, but 99.9% of them don't really provide much utility. And if you look from one cycle to another, usually the basket of altcoins that are in the top 10 can can very much change, you know, over over a few year time period. Because you know, the issue is that you know, when we get into a new cycle, there's new shiny altcoins that people care about. And you know, no one cares about the boomer coins from the last cycle, the sort of the relics of the Stone Age. They just sort of hop on whatever the new bandwagon is. So right now, I think you're seeing the uh, the flight to safety play in, in within crypto. And that essentially involves the altcoin liquidity from the altcoin market bleeding back to Bitcoin. Um, and, and because of that, it can actually lead to, to the price of Bitcoin going up, but eventually that liquidity from the altcoin market will, and, and the devaluation of altcoins on, on their Bitcoin pairs and their USD pairs will get so low that not even those can necessarily hold, hold the price up for, for Bitcoin. And then eventually you'll see, you'll likely see Bitcoin, uh, come back down. But the important part to look at when that occurs is does the altcoin market go down with it? Um, or does it go down faster than Bitcoin? And and if it does, which is what I'm hoping for, it can it can lead to the next phase where it, it might make sense to accumulate altcoins again. Um, but it's a, it's a brutal cycle, uh, and and you know people that buy altcoins in like you know late 2021 or early 2022, you just you you watch most of them devalue not only on their USD pairs. But also on their um, also on their Bitcoin pairs, and and the point is is Bitcoin is a much safer a much safer investment than the altcoin market, and so if you're going to take on more risk and go into the altcoin market, you would expect a higher return. But if the dominance is likely heading higher, Bitcoin, you're likely not going to be getting a higher return in the altcoin market right now. Now I think that could change. I mean I think the uh, sort of the the, the risk. The, the risk on the altcoin market might change in like six months, nine months, and it might make more sense again with respect to Bitcoin. But right now, I, I think we're very much in um, in Bitcoin season. And, and that means no matter what direction Bitcoin goes, whether it's up or down, the altcoin market is likely going to continue bleeding back to it. Interesting. You mentioned something else there about altcoins having utilities and some just being, uh, you know, not having utilities, I'll say. And it was one of the things like early on, I tried to really get into, I was like, you know, to me, it makes sense to maybe invest in something that has a utility to it because it has a practical application in the real world that to me equates similarly to as if it were a real business, you know, a Chry you know, Chrysler or somebody that's building cars, like there's a business behind it potentially down the road at least. Others seemed like, you know, Doge, I guess, is a good example where to me, it just seemed like, I don't know, it's only going up because it's popular at the moment. Like there's nothing behind it, which is terrifying to me. And it really made me feel like, um, you know, the altcoin market was something where you almost had to be 
I, maybe not a day trader, but you had to stay up on what was happening in the markets like very regularly if you were going to be invested in altcoins. And so for me, I, I, I kind of gravitated towards playing it more safe. But do I sort of have, uh, is that typically true or do I have a, is that a, a, a worthwhile understanding of that where the altcoins you have to pay more attention to on a, on a daily basis as we're like, maybe with Bitcoin, maybe, you know, I don't really want to put Ethereum in with Bitcoin, but um, it seems a little more steady than some of the other altcoins. Certainly, do I do I kind of have a read on that right, or or am I projecting? So, so I'm not a day trader at all. Um, I I try to just pick up investments in these you know assets and and then let them ride for hopefully at least one or two years to lock in like long term capital gains um, rather than short term, uh, but. I think you're right in the sense that Ethereum is, it's sort of in between. I, I don't think it's as safe as Bitcoin, but I think it's safer than the altcoin market, you know, in general. I think it's sort of like the index of the altcoin market. Like if you're buying altcoins and you can't outperform Ethereum, then just buy Ethereum, right? You know, like Ethereum is 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 going to be, uh, and there's always these Ethereum killers, right? And, and nothing has really come close. But no, I, I wouldn't say that it's it's. You, I wouldn't say that you have to be a day trader. But I, I would argue that day traders probably v benefit significantly from altcoin volatility. So that's. I mean, you might have the right handle on it. It depends on on what type of trader you are. But for me, um, you know, who's not really a, a short term trader, I find value in the altcoin market. Um, you know, after they've after they've severely devalued on their Bitcoin pairs to the tune of like ninety to ninety five percent, which it always sounds crazy, uh, but we see it happen time and time again. So for me, what I what I'm looking for is normally it, it's around the third third to fourth quarter um, before the halving year of Bitcoin, where you'll you'll typically find altcoins bottoming out uh, on their USD pairs. It, it can happen a little bit later than that. But that's generally, I think, the sort of the expectation is that altcoins can bottom, um, you know, much later. And we saw that we saw that last cycle as well. So I, I think the way to play the altcoin market is, you know, to, you, you basically you wait for the dominance of Bitcoin to get, you know, to a certain level. Um, I mean, I, I think 50 percent is a is a must, but that's not the only only sort of prerequisite. I also think you need to see that the altcoin market bleed as well when Bitcoin comes back down. And then if all that happens and, you know, we're sitting at a, at a Bitcoin dominance of like 55, 60% sometime in the next like six to nine months, then I, then I think the altcoin market would make more sense. And, and you don't have to pick them up to, to just sort of hold them for a day. It's just you, you pick them up because the liquidity is completely dried up. No one cares about them anymore because they've lost all their value, their shell of their former self. And, and that's when you buy them in sort of the hopes that the cryptoverse um, rises again. And, and, it, and it historically does. I mean, we've had plenty of cycles where, where it seems like the cryptoverse is, is dying off, but then it just sort of comes stronger, comes back stronger the following cycle. So that's where I am on the altcoin market. I just think that, um, you know, like if you're going to DCA, uh, you know, DCA can often work with Bitcoin quite well over a long period of time. But DCAing with altcoins uh, is really hit or miss because there's plenty of altcoins that just go to zero, you know? So like, you know, trying to reduce your cost basis, it can still go down 99% from wherever you buy uh, if you buy the wrong one. Whereas Bitcoin, I think, is a, is, a, is a much safer place. So I think with the altcoin market, the altcoin market is, I think, a lot more about timing. Um, whereas Bitcoin, it, it, it's not as important, I think. I think as long as you come up with sort of a, 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 a strategy to DCA, at, at generally low levels, um, then I, I think you'll be fine over the long haul. Interesting. What do you, you know, we, you, you, we touched just a, a little bit there on, on the difference between where Ethereum kind of lies in this. And I've heard some recent conversations about what the different cryptos uh, will be considered. And it seems like it seems like it's leaning that they're going to be considered securities in, 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 for regulation purposes, it seems like it's heading that way. Do you think Bitcoin will be potentially spared? Is it because it's sort of to me, it's the only one that I feel like maybe could actually be a replaceable monetary uh, unit it is. Do you think it will escape that or do you think it'll be lumped in with the securities aspect? I, I think Bitcoin's a commodity. I, I don't think it will be a security. 
Uh, I think that's been made pretty clear by the SEC. I mean, of course, they can always change their mind. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's been some flip flopping on on what they consider Ethereum to be. So I guess you can't always trust what they say. But my opinion is that is that Bitcoin is a commodity. I don't see any reason why it's why it should be a security. You know, we don't even no one really knows exactly who the founder is anyways. Um, and, and you don't it's not like you're buying Bitcoin. Uh, with the expectation that someone very specific is going to go out and, and try to, you know, make sure you get a return or something on your investment. It's just, you know, you're, you're sort of speculating that the adoption of Bitcoin will generally grow, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be because of any individual person. It's just because sort of a collectively as a whole, there's more adoption on it. So I don't think Bitcoin uh, will be considered a security at all. I think it's, it, it'll be a commodity. And um Beyond that, I mean, I, I do think the the altcoin market has that idiosyncratic risk that Bitcoin does not have. And that is one of the reasons I think you're seeing the altcoin market bleed back to Bitcoin right now is because it's the flight to safety. Because, you know, if, if, if everyone's starting to worry about are these altcoins actually securities or not, it'd be a lot easier just to not have them, you know, than to, than to figure out what you're going to have to do. And listen, I mean, like I buy securities all the time. I mean, you buy, if you go buy a stock, it's a security. You know, so it's not that a security is the end of the world if if altcoins end up becoming securities. But what it would do is it would help separate you know some of the garbage projects from the actual pro you know from the actual projects that can you know go through the filing process and 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 you know actually provide the sort of the necessary paperwork so that so that investors are are theoretically more you know theoretically more protected according to the SEC, right? I mean, this is all according to them. I'm just trying to better understand, like you know, what they are going to do. It's not always that I necessarily agree or disagree with it. Um, it's just a matter of you know they're probably going to say Bitcoin is a commodity, which they've already said. I think most altcoins, if not all of them, are going to be considered securities. Maybe there, maybe there could be a few that are spared, uh, but it, it's hard to know exactly which one of those are going to be. And and so sort of the base case, I think, is just assume Bitcoin is a commodity and, and there's a question mark on everything else. Yeah, it's an interesting balance because it feels like there's, a, 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 you know, a lot of people today that are sort of skeptical. I know there's been uh, some some a lot of talk about monetary policy just recently um, with Jerome Powell and and kind of everybody's anticipating a recession and and kind of looking at inflation rates and, and all these sorts of things. Um but, you know, it, I guess really comes down to how much do you do you trust those? Because I feel like a lot of people that got into crypto early on wanted to avoid all, all of those things. And they're kind of looking at any regulation as, as a bad thing. But I am starting to hear this same kind of sentiment where it is, uh, you know, it could clean up some of the some of the risk riskier factors out there um, in, in the way some of this stuff isn't very transparent with with some of the some of the uh, crypto out there. So per, perhaps that would be helpful um, in, in, as we move forward. Um, what is what is sort of your read on some of the recent developments? I've been hearing now that we're um, going into a recession for the last two years where don't, don't seem to quite be there. And and the inflation rates obviously are, are going up across the country. Um, what do you what can you explain sort of I, I also keep hearing this thing about they're not there that we have to have higher unemployment before we can start going back in the other direction and lower inflation. Do you do you have an understanding, or could you, if if you do have an understanding, could you explain kind of that correlation, what ties all that together, uh, and 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 sure. why that's true, if if it is true? Yeah. So first of all, regarding your question about you know recession, um, this is a sort of a common thing is that you know if you see certain indicators like the inversion of the yield curve. Um, and, and some of the leading indicators, it can often lead to people making a call for a recession prematurely, just because it seems like it's it's going to happen. But the business cycle is very slow. I mean, it can take a long time. The average time it takes after the inversion of, say, the two-year and 10-year yields uh, to actually be in a recession, it can be like, I think it's like over a year, like maybe like 17 months or something. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But I mean, it's something over a year, I think. And, and, you know, we're not, you know, we're around that point now, or I think it's still further out, like, you know, another several months before we even reach the average amount of time. And so, um, 
one thing that you can learn that we could that we can all learn, I guess, I think, from looking at 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 the yield curve is that when it's on it, when it's inverted like it is now, typically you're not in a recession when it's inverted, right? It just it just means one one is coming eventually, but it could be a year or two later you know, from, from when it, from when it inverts. So I think the reason you, you see so many people calling for a recession is because it seems like the recipe is there for it to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And, and what it's going to take is, you know, I, and I, I think we probably are heading for one, because if you look at the context of history, like what pushes us into a recession historically, it's the federal reserve uh, becoming too hawkish and, and uh, raising rates too much. And, um, you know, going through QT, quantitative tightening, um, this happens. And, you know, normally, if we were experiencing things like we're experiencing right now, or where people were worried just a few days ago about a run on the banks, obviously, we know that the Federal Reserve backstop deposits to help, you know, temper that risk. But the, the problem is that um, when when this stuff, when this stuff occurs, it it, I mean, it, it's sort of a reflection that there already there, there's some cracks that are already starting to form in the economy, right? Like if if you're seeing some of these banks managing billions and millions of dollars, um, you know, if they're having to now rely on the Fed to backstop deposits because they took on too much risk when they shouldn't have, and I mean, it shows you that that that, that cracks are starting to form. So, you know, I'm of the opinion that we're not in a recession right now. But we probably are going to be in one before we resolve before we really resolve this mess. Now, to your other question about the unemployment rate, one of the things that that Powell has said, Jerome Powell has said many times, is that he would like to see the softening of labor market conditions. And the issue is that one of the one of the co- components of inflation that can keep it elevated is wage inflation. And wage inflation can occur if there's no, if the labor market is really tight. So. You know, imagine we're trying like imagine if you're trying to hire someone, but no one really wants to work because the labor market's tight. Like everyone already has a job or they just don't they're not incentivized to work because you don't want to pay them enough. So if the labor market is is too tight, it can lead to wage inflation, which is where you know people just keep getting paid more and more to just sort of incentivize them to go find them to go work for a various company. But I mean, of course, there are benefits to people getting paid more, right? I'm not trying to say that there are, are you know, that's that's only a, a bad thing. But the, the the negative aspect of it is if people are getting paid a lot more and their wages are going up uh, too quickly, that can also be, you know, sort of uh, um, another upward pressure on inflation. Like, you know, if, if people are making more money, they're likely their demand from them is, is going to be higher. They're going to be more likely to go buy stuff. And if they're more likely to go buy stuff, then that's going to send you know the the inflation up in other sectors you know other than just say wage inflation. So if 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 the Federal Reserve is is successful in what they're trying to do, they you know they're they're trying to loosen up the labor market. They're trying to raise the unemployment rate so that theoretically there's more people like the the the, the pool of people that are out there that want to find a job is larger. And therefore, if a company wants to go hire someone, they don't have to you know offer all these great things just to get that worker to come work for them. Because it, 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 they're, I think what they're trying to do is they're, they're trying to turn this from an employee's market to an employer's market, right? So for a long time, the employee has had the upper hand. I mean, the employee has had all the leverage, right? Like, hey, if you want me to come work for you, I'm going to have to have this, this, and this. But, you know, I mean, if, if, they, if they kill the economy and if they make the economy very bad, if people get laid off, um, you know, and, and, and you have to figure out how you're going to, how you're going to survive and, and pay your rent and pay your bills. It's going to make people, you know, more desperate to find a job. And it's not, it's not, necess- it's not, necess- it's not necessarily something that I, you know, that I think anyone necessarily wants to see. It's not like we're, you know, we're cheering for the unemployment rate to go up, but it's sort of just like the sobering reality of what the federal reserve is trying to do. And, and, and they've said it many times, you know, Powell has come out and said many times that they want to see softening of labor market conditions um, so that they can get inflation back down. And, and, and sort of the question that it, it raises is why, like, why, why does the fed want to do that? And, you know, again, if you have to ask yourself, you know, like if, if the unemployment rate is this low, what's going to hurt people more over the long term is is inflation at 6 7 8% year over year. If you go to the grocery store today, you spend a lot more than you would have just a couple of years ago. Uh so imagine if inflation were to continue at that at that pace for like two or three more years, just imagine how difficult that could get for, you know, for just 
average people. It would be very, very, very difficult um, for for a lot of people to navigate that. And so, Al's basically saying, "Hey, I know it. I know it sucks. You know, I, I know it, it's gonna st- it's gonna be painful to see the unemployment rate go up, but it's sort of a necessary." component to to sort of kill off this inflationary cycle that we're in. Yeah, it's it's interesting you 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 stated a couple of interesting things cuz I'm I'm out here in California. It's a very uh labor friendly kind of place, not you know, I think a lot of people would say it's not very business friendly in some regards. Um and you know, to hear people out here talk, you know, Obviously, there are still a lot of, uh, you know, we want to see people making living wages and doing all these things. But to hear people out here talk sometimes, it seems like, you know, corporations are just killing, killing the common worker and the common worker has has no has no, uh, you know, real leverage in in the scenario. And and there's this push to kind of go to re-expand unions and which is is fine. But. Um, I think it is a sobering reality because I think people sometimes, even in business, I, I experienced this as well, where people think every year we have to have increasing profits. We can never fluctuate or go down and then go back up or we're going to lose our jobs. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes people have this expectation with the economy as well that, you know, we should, you know, through regulation and through monetary policy, we should never have a recession. We should never have any hiccups or ups and downs. It should all be a 45 degree angle steadily going up forever. And I think it is a little bit of a sobering reality that it is about balance. You can't have one thing without something else happening, happening to balance it out. And I think that jobs, you know, is a good way, is, is a good example of that where, Look, it's not that anybody really wants uh, people to be out of work, but it is a fact that, you know, you change this condition in the market and it has this effect on the market. And I think sometimes that's really missed by the average person and it's not very well conveyed, certainly by mainstream media in when they discuss these these facts. Right. And actually, one of the thing, one of the interesting things is that so far, the tightening cycle by the Fed has mostly affected tech workers. Um, it's where a majority, you know, out where you are, right? In California and then Silicon Valley. I mean, that's where a lot of workers have been affected. I mean, obviously there's other areas as well, but uh, the tech sector has gotten hit pretty hard because I mean, those are the ones that that do the best under really low rates and, um, you know, access to that cheap liquidity, which they don't really have anymore. So, yeah, in fact, you know, kind of kind of bef- going into that, you know, it, it, it is interesting because I think the tech world has kind of changed the way businesses is, are generally thought about. I know in, in my in the industry I work in, I, I work in the cannabis industry and it's very much adopted this uh, this Silicon Valley sort of mentality where it's like you're just you're just succeeding enough to get to your next raise to to then get to the next raise to then sell out one day before ever having to turn a profit and it it's uh it's a worrisome business model from my perspective um in in, in eventually wanting to turn a profit on something um but you know you talk about you mentioned silicon valley so i have to, i have to sort of mention all the hoopla around the the banks this 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 past week um because one of the things that I have heard was that these banks were taking and and I guess um, I guess Silicon Valley Bank in particular was taking increased risks beyond what they had the deposits to cover. Right. And, and that's sort of what they're, I think, being criticized for, if I understand that correctly, or at least partly. But. Also, my understanding is that not kind of the basis of what fractional reserve lending is like banks never actually have enough on hand to cover all the deposits. Any bank is is that not true? That that is true. I mean, (laughs) that's uh, 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 that is true. But I I think what what happened here is that um, they didn't hedge like at all. And and, you know, I mean, obviously, the bigger bank, a lot of the bigger banks did. But some of the smaller, but which I mean, again, like it's not even that small of a bank. I mean, it's it's kind of insane that there wasn't any more hedging on sort of this interest rate in this interest rate risk and uh, these long these long duration assets that they were holding. And you know, how do you have this multi billion dollar bank not consider that? Hey, maybe the Fed's going to raise rates um, with high inflation. I mean, I it's not entirely. I mean. I, I will say, like, I don't know if it's entirely their fault. It is their fault. Let me say that. But there is some element of like the Fed did say that inflation was transitory. So you have to imagine that when some of these decisions were made, 
they were probably relying on the Federal Reserve's grasp of thinking that inflation was transitory and that they wouldn't raise rates nearly as much as they did. Uh, but because all this happened, you know, every time the Fed raised another 25 basis points, it was making these banks lose a ton of money. Um, and so like that, that's ultimately the issue. If, if a lot of these banks, you know, they, they'll hedge, they'll hedge these things, th th these things so that if something like this happens, it's not going to put them out of business. But if you have a bank, uh, like Silicon Valley bank and, and, and one, one sort of argument I saw put out was, well, maybe they were just ignorant which I don't even think is true because they have actually hedged this very thing in the past. It's just for whatever reason, this time they decided not to, you know, not to really hedge it in the same way. And um, yeah, I mean, what, you know, you get, you essentially just get a run on the bank. Uh, there's a, it starts with a whisper and, and then everyone just sort of runs to the exit because they, they just start to think that the bank is, you know, is, is not solvent. And um and they're, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't really. And I mean, of course you have now the fed, uh, coming in and, and backstopping deposits uh, so that, you know, so that people like you and me or, or companies that they don't get hurt for the, uh, you know, for the, for the bad risks that the bank took. But I, I am at least happy to see that the Fed is not bailing out the investor. Like, you know, they're not, they're not really bailing out like the investors of the bank. You know, I mean, it's like you you took on a risk and it didn't pay off. It, it's not up to the taxpayer to bail you out. Um, I, I am a little bit more sympathetic to, you know, to depositors. Um, you know, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not going to sit up here and, and wish that anyone loses their money. Um, you know, so it, it just sort of calls into question, you know, what is the Fed going to do next week? Because, um, you know, their balance sheet just went up by 300 billion in over the last week, which basically takes takes the balance sheet back to the levels it was at in like November of 2022. So they kind of unwound uh, some of what they've accomplished with quantitative tightening over the last few months. Now, it's not exactly the same thing as, as you might think uh, with traditional QE, where they're just printing money out of thin air. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it does... It, I, I think it's going to put... It's going to make Powell have to answer some pretty tough questions next week. Um, you know, to figure out, you know, he's, he, he, we basically had the entire last year and a half of just listening to Powell say that they're not going to stop until the job is done. And that, and that, you know, prematurely loosening power or history prematurely, or sorry, history cautions against prematurely loosening policy. Uh, because we, we saw what would happen in the seventies with inflation. We had several different waves of it when they prematurely loosened policy, the same thing happened back in the forties as well. Um, and so we'll see what, we'll see what Powell's going to do. I mean, you know, we'll see if he, uh, if he means what he said next week. I mean, I think he's got to go at least another 25 basis points uh, just to make sure that people know he's he's serious. Um, but yeah, it should be, uh, should be, uh, the most important FOMC meeting ever, at least until the next one, right? <laughs> Everyone, every meeting seems like that. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Um, you know, I, I would, I would definitely say, you know, referring back to the bank executives, I, I, I have to say that I don't think they were ignorant. I think I saw a, a report that said that they were uh, apparently aware enough to uh, secure their own funds before the bank actually went down, which so that that always makes me a little suspicious. Um, but that could, that could, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that got clawed back, like to be, you know, because like, it, it, it would look very suspect because I know some of them took out, you know, a, a lot of money just before it collapsed. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you talked about protecting the depositors and, and look, I think Anybody, you know, even if it's a tech company in Silicon Valley, I think anybody who has tried to start a business, starting a business, making it successful is really difficult. Uh, whether it's a small business and your budget's $100,000 or you're a, a tech company and you've got $100 million in the bank. To think that you're out there trying to kill it every day and, and that you're just going to get up one morning and your money is, is no longer available to you is absolutely terrifying and and you know look they shouldn't they shouldn't lose their 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 money at the same time i don't know how we hold these people accountable because to me if we're if we're backing if we're going to back this above the quarter million dollars right we're basically saying that we're going to back everything everywhere and right. i don't know how we can financially cover that i mean to to put this back on the taxpayers to cover every deposit in the country i just don't know how we can fiscally 
balance that? My guess is that there's going to be a lot more regulation for a lot of these banks coming up uh, just to make sure that they don't get into this predicament as or there's always going to be something right in 20 years. We're going to make the same mistakes. Right. But um, I you, you can already see that there, there's going to be some more regulation, I think, on these banks. But you're right. I mean, you know, what's the point of having a quarter million dollar limit if if it's not really a limit? If, if you're really just going to backstop everything, why even say it's 250k, you know, 250k FDIC insured because you know a lot of people will will sort of spread their wealth around so that they make sure that everything is FDIC insured. But if if the limit is is really not true, then there's it it you know there's not as much reason to sort of spread it around. And so, and I think recently there was um they were sort of talking and. And it seems like and I'm not like I'm honestly like not completely read up on this, but I was looking at some of it recently. And it seems like they're not even necessarily providing the same type of thing to every single bank in the country, um, which could which could actually lead more to a, a monopoly uh, in some regards where people are just going to flee community banks, local community banks, just be in the relative safety of a much larger bank, which is not going to be good. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, capitalism and having competition and all that sort of stuff, if 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 only a few banks end up winning out. So, yeah, I don't really know. I, I, I don't know that I have like necessarily like the right answer to the problem. Um, but with that said, you know, had they allowed the, the the banks to fail and the depositors lose their money, it would have led to a a run on the banks like nationwide. And then I think we would have probably, that would have been a bigger problem arguably than inflation. Uh, if if literally everyone in the country doesn't even know if the money in the bank they have is safe above a quarter, you know, above a quarter million dollars. I mean, think about how many businesses that would have killed off. Uh, I mean, it would, it would have destroyed innovation in this country for a long time, I think, had they allowed that to happen. So, I mean, it, it, it kind of sucks that that happened. Um, but I, I understand why they did it and, and, um, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what's next for the, uh, for, for regulation of the banking sector. It's just a tough perception. You know, I heard someone talking, uh, er earlier this week about just the perception of it, even if it's the right decision to do the perception of it is very tough for the average person, because when you start talking about the jobs that were going to be lost and I, there's some people that. I listen to on a regular basis and I generally respect a lot of what they have to say, but they're heavily invested in the tech uh, markets. And, and uh, you know, uh, it was interesting hearing them come out this past week, really going hard about all the tech jobs that were going to be lost. And then I heard someone else that took that conversation and they said, look, the reality is the tech jobs, the, the jobs that are in the tech sector are like, one and a half percent of the jobs in this country. It's if they lost all their jobs, it would not be as impactful as if it, you know, hit the manufacturing sector in the Midwest or something more along those lines. And so it's just it's a very difficult perception to get people to understand that it may be, you know, stopped the bleeding, so to speak, um, be from becoming much worse. Um, it's just a real tough political uh, time, I think, to have that kind of messaging. But yeah, and I mean, once it once it actually hits, um, like you said, like once it hits further in, like say, like you know, those jobs in the Midwest, and um, like that would probably be would would more likely make the Fed want to pivot. You know, like once it reaches that far, it just it just takes a long time for these rate hikes to propagate through the economy. And you're right. I mean, the the tech sector. You know, I think I've read it was yeah. I think I read two percent, but yeah, one and a half, two percent. Uh, it's not a lot. And, and if you see a company lay off a, a couple thousand people, like that sounds like a lot, but oftentimes they hired 10,000 people last year, you know? Um, so it, it, it really is, um, it, it, the business cycle is just a very slow thing. I mean, it takes so long to play out. And, and that is why really going back to that sort of that first or one of the first questions about a recession, that's why, you know, everyone calls for a recession because it seems obvious that one's coming, but I mean, again, it can t it can just take quarter after quarter after quarter to, to see everything propagate through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's it seems to always have been a, a lag period that when when things happen, people expect immediate results, and when it's happening on such a grand scale, there's there seems to be always be a lag period, whether it's with policy or whether it's things happening in the markets. Um, there there always seems to be that little bit of a, of a lag period. Um, 
You also, while we're talking about the banks, I also wanted to touch on on Silvergate a little bit because they had uh, there's and, and and I'm not very in. It, I'm not overly knowledgeable on this, but I wanted to, wanted to discuss it with you because my understanding is that they had this securities exchange network, which really made uh, the movement of, 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 of crypto much easier. And that um, by knocking out this network, it, it really has sort of crippled the ease from which uh, crypto is is first of all even banked because i think now we're you know crypto is is down to you know i know uh, silicon valley bank has gotten a lot of the attention but there were a couple smaller banks that carry, ca catered specifically to crypto that kind of got overlooked and one of these i think was silvergate can you get into a little bit of, of how impactful that really is? Because like I've heard a few people that were saying that, you know, this all could be an orchestrated way to sort of justify now coming in and bringing in the regulations on crypto and giving them that justification for doing so. Um, what, what is what is your understanding or, or take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think very much um, that, you know, they're going after crypto. I, 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 it's kind of like a scapegoat to some degree, you know, blaming the cryptoverse for all these problems. But in reality, the problems are going to be there, uh, you know, whether whether it's crypto. I mean, all this stuff happened, a lot, not necessarily every, the same thing, but a lot of this stuff has happened in the past. It, it's just a, it was a different vehicle that, that sort of led to it. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that the regulators are, are sort of cutting off liquidity from the cryptoverse. And th that's not to say that there still are not on and off ramps. I mean, there are. And I mean, I you know, you can go deposit money with, say, like an exchange. You can do that. Um, but even there, there's there's some exchanges recently that I saw that are, are cutting off certain certain customers from certain places. The issue is that if you want to start a crypto company, you know, that's sort of centered around crypto, you got to find a banking partner. And and some of these banks that went down were just a lot more lenient, I think, in terms of in terms of what they would, you know, who they would lend money to or who they would um, allow to bank with them in general. And and that that sort of allowed some of these companies that were not really properly managing their risk. They all went down. Right. Like, think about every single crypto company that went down. You have. Um, you know, Celsius, BlockFi, Voyager, FTX. Uh, I mean, there's been some issues with Genesis recently. There, I mean, there's just been like the, the, the list goes on in Luna and UST, right? There's been so many different collapses recently in crypto. And so now, obviously, you know, these the sort of the regulators want to go after the banks to sort of enable some of this stuff, right? Um, now there are other companies that that do provide banking for crypto companies. They just are are going to be a lot more scrutinized about about these companies. So sort of the the bright side of it is that while any future crypto companies that that form are going to be scrutinized a lot more and therefore there's hopefully a higher likelihood that you know they they have sort of the um like a a better ability to survive because they're they're managing their risk better than prior companies. But on the other hand, the liquidity is drying up. You know, I mean, in general, liquidity is drying up. People are leaving the cryptoverse. Uh, I mean, look, if if you lost your money in in one of these things, you're more like a lot of these people are just more likely to leave and not come back. So I sort of think this is kind of equivalent to the dot com crash uh, for crypto, and and maybe even a combination of the dot com crash and the financial crisis. Because within crypto, I mean, there's been quite a few different financial crises with, you know, FTX or with, you know, just everything we've seen people losing their money everywhere, uh, leverage just imploding in the, in the collapse of, of, of Luna and, and the stable coin UST. Um, so I think what the regulators are doing, I think they're basically just trying to, to drain the cryptoverse of liquidity and, and to sort of make the, the, the projects, make some of the companies and projects collapse as sad as it is. I mean, as sad as it is, but I think that's what they're trying to do. And I, I do think the cryptoverse will, will fight back. And I, I think we'll be stronger eventually because of it, but I don't really think there's any denying that 
that some of the some of the recent actions have have sort of set the cryptoverse back, you know, a few years. Yeah. You mentioned two 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 former examples, you know, you're very big on cycles and, and time. Um, you mentioned the dot com and you mentioned the 1940s earlier. In 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 what ways for for those that maybe aren't 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 privy to what you're referring to, especially going all the back for many listeners probably don't know about the 1940s very much at all. Um, what what is the correlation there that you're, you're that you're referring to? Yeah, so in the 1940s, after World War II, there was also a period of high inflation, and and you know because go, when you when you go fight a world war a world war, there's going to be a lot of money printing to help finance that to help finance that war, and the byproduct of it is inflation. But people are willing to live with it because you know they're like, well, we got to go fight this war. Uh, but during that time, of course, from we there was a there was a bear market in the S and P five hundred from nineteen forty six to nineteen forty nine. So it essentially lasted three years, and 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 basically the S and P just sort of scraped the lows uh, for three years, and it didn't go anywhere. You know, I mean, we we sort of would pop back up occasionally, and and everyone would get excited, but then we would eventually just revisit the lows, and this went on for three years. The same thing essentially occurred in the 70s, but it was a different, you know, we had high inflation in the 70s, um, more of a supply, a, a supply based thing, but the inflation kept coming back. It came back three times and it took until Volcker, uh, sort of the equivalent of Powell now, right? But, you know, he raised rates so much and, and knocked us into two uh, recessions, sort of back to back. And that's what it took to bring inflation down. Uh, one one good thing about recessions is if you look at history, they bring inflation back down uh, because if you're in a recession, people aren't going to go spend money as much and that's going to reduce demand and it's going to bring prices down. So the reason I mentioned the 40s is because that was during a period of high inflation. The reason I mentioned the 70s during a period of high inflation. The reason why I mentioned the dot-com crash is because it's it's very similar to sort of crypto. You had all these tech companies pop up and a lot of them were useless. You know, like, I mean, pets.com, uh, that was sort of the, uh, sort of the flagship, like garbage one that just sort of wasn't anything and, and just sort of disintegrated into the oblivion of, of, of whatever. I mean, this is, is something that we saw play out 20 years ago where tech stocks essentially entered into a two and a half year bear market. Um, and it was brutal. And I, I look at that and I'm like, man, like that must've been brutal to live through. But I think crypto, I, I think you could make the case that crypto is, is sort of going through that now. And um, and there's just a lot of pain to, to, to be had. And what's funny is if you look at the market cap of tech stocks back in uh, the dot-com crash, they reached around 3 trillion, which is exactly where crypto reached at its peak around 3 trillion. And additionally, there's another similarity. Um, we had crypto overtake the Super Bowl and it was called the Crypto Bowl, if you remember, in 2022. Well, guess what? Over 20 years ago, after the dot-com mania, they called it the dot-com bowl because dot-com companies overtook the Super Bowl. So essentially, if you see if you see sort of like a new and upcoming technology advertising at the Super Bowl, it's probably not a good time to buy it. Because think about it, like think about it like this. In order for them to have afforded Super Bowl ads, they had to make a killing in some mania phase. At the end of that, you know, you don't want to be the person left holding the bags. So those are those are sort of the similarities. Now, the, the positive aspect of it is look at tech stocks today, 20 years later. You know, you can't imagine, we can't even imagine this world without Microsoft and Apple and Google. Like that's just it, it's just sort of in our in our society and and everyone, you know, these tech stocks are sort of the um the backbone of, of a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of American jobs and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think that, you know, there's a good chance that in 20 years, crypto will will sort of be in a very similar spot. But right now we're just going through growing pains and trying to figure out, you know, what companies are, are going to survive and, and which ones are not. And that sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Bitcoin and altcoins. You know, like this is the phase that that Bitcoin is, 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 it's the more obvious play. And that's not to say that Bitcoin can't go back down. I do think it will come back down before we go on a, a more sustained bull run. But you don't know which altcoins are going to survive, right? You really don't. And until until this until this uh, rate hiking cycle is, is more close to being over and until QT is more close to being over, I just don't think that altcoin market, you know, you're, you're just gambling a lot. And look, I mean, if you had bought Apple back then, um, you would have made a killing. But... There was also a thousand other companies that you could have bought that went to zero, right? So it's just really hard to know. 
Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. That's a good point. We're we're one of the things that uh, that I've that I've heard about too um, is you know printing money. It dry. It, it it it. I don't I don't understand. There's a couple things here I don't understand related to printing money with no backing. First of all, it I think is a reason why a lot of people have become interested became interested in crypto because. It's like, well, look, if we're just printing money out of thin air, isn't that the same thing as a as a token with no with no purpose, uh, no utility? Uh, isn't that basically the same thing? And now I see this push that, you know, and, and we were talking just a few minutes ago about how, uh, you know, the government maybe is, is trying to regulate a little more, kind of trying to dry up some of the some of the financial access to the crypto uh, companies. I hear about this rise of the digital bank currency from the central bank. And I'm I, I'm I'm wondering if if it sort of feels to me like the landscape as I as I look back on it. And again, I'm, I'm not heavily in the middle of knee deep in it or anything, but it feels like the that they see an opportunity here to force people away from from cash. And also at the same time, trying to divert them from going over here and having something like Bitcoin become a dominant form of currency so that they can force people onto their central bank digital currency reserve, which is, I think, for a lot of people, very terrifying in a lot of ways, which I think eventually will drive people back to Bitcoin and, and back into crypto if they've decided to leave, as you mentioned earlier. Um, how big of a, I mean, how big of a concern do you think is the central bank digital currencies and how do you see that sort of integrating or do you see it replacing some of the elements that are currently in crypto? Yeah, I mean, so it's always important to think like, what are the benefits and negative aspects of CDBCs, right? Um, the benefits of them are, you know, you'd have it be more efficient than what they currently do. I mean, like if you think about all the advances we've made in some some areas, like and the fact that it, you know, if you want to send money to someone in a different country, it can take days for it to get there and, and the, all sorts of stuff that go on behind the scenes to make that stuff happen. So there's some level of increase in uh, increased efficiency there. But in the same regard, like a lot of that stuff, crypto kind of solves as well uh, and not at the expense of increased surveillance. I think that's the biggest thing. That, that people are worried about is, you know, if there's a CBDC, the government's going to be able to easily see everything that you do. Um, and, and that's not, that's not, I think, going to go over well with a lot of people. And I think that's probably going to be one of the bull cases in the next, um, you know, like in the next few years. And, um, you know, people are, are likely going to go back into Bitcoin. Now, I mean, and also because not just because of the CB, CDBC, but also just, you know, Look, I mean, look at the uh, constant debasement of the U.S. dollar, right? I mean, do you just want to sit in cash forever? I mean, I, I think there is a phase where cash is king, and arguably we're still in that phase right now. But look, eventually, uh, eventually, the, the the truth is that cash is just gonna is going to zero over the long haul, right? I mean, if you look at the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, it, it's just going down <laughs> over you know every single year, going back for a, a really long time. Um, and so that I think is is ultimately the you know going to be a, a bull case for Bitcoin in the next cycle. But you're right. I mean, you know, the, 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 there are benefits I think to them, but I don't know. I, I don't really think that the um, the you know the ability of the government to see exactly what you're doing. I, I don't really feel like it's justified. So I would prefer not to have one. Uh, but as always, it doesn't really matter what I prefer. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I would not be surprised at all if if that's the direction we're heading. Like it, it kind of seems like they're using some of the recent events as justification for you know, and I could see them using some of these events as more justification for going into you know more in that direction over the coming years. But I don't think they're going to be implementing it, um, you know, within the next year or anything. It's going to be it's going to probably be several years away at the very least. And it's not something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, no, you you mentioned something about you know privacy, security issues. You know, I I I've heard this mentioned, especially when it came uh, comes to uh, if I don't know if you kept up with it, but I guess over over last year, or the year before, sometime when COVID was going on, I guess there was a trucker strike or something in Canada, and the Canadian government actually 
went in and right. seized bank accounts or something. And uh, for to me, it just seems like, you know, if if we're on a government digital currency, it seems very easy for them to be able to go in and just shut off your money or take it away or shut down your accounts if they don't like something you're doing. So uh, it seems That's like an scary. interesting precedent. Yeah, for sure. It's very scary. It's very scary to think about how how easy that could be, like, you know, like how people I mean, like, think about the political ramifications of something like that. And and um, yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to one of the biggest stories uh, in recent has been has been FTX. And uh, I, I, ha I'd have, I have to bring it up uh, here to discuss a little bit because it is a mind blowing story to me. This I, I the more I have found out about this story, the more amazing it is to me that SBF was able to get this kind of money in some regards uh, from the stories of 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 him doing of of him playing video games on conference calls and and all all sorts of just unprofessionalism like I know people in business that would have never given this guy any money never in a never in their life would have given him money and yet he got money from some of the most impressive uh, funders out there and it's even has amazed me even more all the seeming connections that he had to a lot of influential and important people. Um, through, you know, his, his parents and, and things like that. Um, and then, and then kind of to, to, to top it all off, I, I, I understand, uh, if it's correct, you know, I don't want to spread false information, but I've heard from several sources that he's, you know, uh, was the largest funder to the Democrats or one of the largest funders to the democratic party, but secretly was also one of the largest, largest funders to the Republicans parties as well. So he was kind of spreading this all over the place. And it just seems like, I, I don't know if it's if it was a if it was intended to be a scam or a scheme, but it certainly seemed like some sort of a shell game or a Ponzi scheme to some extent with the way they were they were running things there. And uh, I guess, you know, I've kind of set all that up, but like, and, and, and would love to get your opinion on it. But, you know, I guess my question really is, how, how do you see this affecting the, the crypto crypto's future and i know we've talked about regulations and everything already but i think more from the mindset of like for somebody like myself even who's very novice in this you know how do you how do you trust the exchanges after something like this happens yeah well the easy answer is you don't and i mean it's sort of like one of the one of the things attractive about crypto is that you can own your own you can own the keys to your bitcoin um and so if if you know, every cycle people learn this lesson, you know, I mean, it was FTX this time, but we had exchanges go down back in, um, you know, back in 2017, 2018 as well. Uh, we also 2013, you know, Mt. Gox got hacked and, and our, you know, some of that, uh, the, the Bitcoin associated with that has just been, um, you know, locked up in, in court for a long time. But the, the thing, the short answer is that you don't trust the exchange. And, and the way that I think about it is you treat an exchange like a public restroom, right? You get in, you do your business and you get out. You don't, you don't sit around, you know, you don't, you don't just hang around there. You just, you, you, if you need to make your transactions, you, you just get out as quickly as you can. Um, so I think that is, is sort of the, uh, the, 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 the knee jerk reaction response. Now, with that said, there is some element of truth that you're not going to you're you're not going to get like worldwide adoption of crypto because if you have to rely on everyone to be knowledgeable enough to figure out you know how to set up a bitcoin wallet and and store it you know there's a lot of people that don't want that responsibility they want someone else to custody their bitcoin um and and rather than rather than just tell these people like hey there's only one right way to do it um you know, I think we're going to have we're going to see the industry come up with with better ways uh, in the future. Now, I will still remain of the opinion that self custody is best, but I'm also not delusional to the point that I would think that you know some some entities are not going to want to self custody their Bitcoin. They'd rather just pay some type of premium to someone else to custody that for them, so they don't have to worry about it. Because to some people, it's worth it, right? You just pay you pay some you know some basis points or whatever on on the overall thing and. Um, you know, someone else covers that for you. But yeah, FTX was, uh, I mean, it was a nightmare because it was set up in a way that, I mean, they were, they were essentially, I mean, again, I, I don't want to get too much into specifics because it really hasn't gone to court and everything, but 
it, it does seem like there was a lot of, of fraudulent behavior going on and, and, um, and, you know, the funds were, were never really safe. And then also the fact that they were, they had like sort of like a hedge fund um, attached to FTX that was, you know, going off and, and, and gambling all this money and, and just losing money. You know, this is not, this is not look good. So in the future, I mean, if for these centralized platforms, there's going to have to be more public scrutiny and, you know, or, and regulation. And I, I wish I, I, you know, 10 years ago, I, I wish this, we wouldn't have gotten here, but if, if history has taught us anything in crypto over the last few years is that people are going to keep making the same mistakes until they're no longer able to. Um, so uh, as unfortunate as it is, human right? nature. Like, uh, <laughs> and the other thing too, to think about is, is to some degree, there's a lot, I, I think, I think of the cryptoverse, like we're in a pond, uh, but there's no outlet to the ocean and where all the big fish are. And, and there's a lot more liquidity out there because the, the cryptoverse pales in comparison to other asset classes. And you're not going to see the cryptoverse grow to the same level as some of these other asset classes until there's more regulation. Because what, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of major institutions that are not going to touch crypto right now. Because first of all, they don't even know what it is they're buying. They don't even know if it's a security or not. You know, so why deal with that uncertainty? So I, I do think regulation will will occur and and it's going to be a painful process going through it, especially for the altcoin market. But eventually, I think the cryptoverse will probably be stronger from it. Do you think that this will force I mean, obviously, FTX was or my understanding was that they were set up outside of the U.S. in, in I think, the Bahamas or, or somewhere in the Caribbean. Do you think the additional regulations are going to force more operators outside of, of the U.S.? Or, you know, because once they go outside the U.S., how, do, how would the U.S. regulate those exchanges? Well, I mean, even there, there's other exchanges. The problem for a lot of these exchanges is that a lot of the capital is in the United States, right? Like they want access to that to that money, to that flow. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the the issue with the regulation, the regulatory uncertainty over here, and really not knowing what's going to do, what's going to happen, is is sending a lot of these companies overseas. Because you know, like what what company wants to operate here if if you're going to get, you know, a notice next week from the SEC, you know, and so why not just go overseas? And I I think you are sorry, you you are going to continue to see that over you know over the coming years, more companies are going to go overseas. And it's sad. Um, I think it's going to set the United States back. I'm hoping that the United States can can come up with some type of regulatory flame, framework quickly, so that people who want to build on you know on top of the cryptoverse in the United States have the ability to do so without constantly wondering you know are they are they breaking some unwritten rule just because it hasn't been regulated yet. So until there's more regulatory oversight, you're going. I think you're going to see that sort of stuff transition overseas. Um, and then hopefully when we do get that regulatory, oh, you know, those, those regulations, I hope that it's done so in a manner that still allows for innovation in the cryptoverse and doesn't just make it so that there's no reason, you know, to innovate if, if, if they just regulate it too much, right? Like you still, you want to see them regulate it, but in a way that, that doesn't just destroy innovation in the cryptoverse within the United States. Because like some companies, like isn't it Binance? They have like a, a, an overseas or an out, out, outside of USA version, and basically a whole right. other business entity that's a USA uh, based version, right? Yeah, they have Binance and Binance US, and then part of the reason they have, I think, Binance US is because they wanted they wanted one specific area where they could, you know, reach the US customers that you know is going to fall under the umbrella of of you know regulation in the United States, but they didn't want that to be tied into their other business as well. Um, so they, they just made, you know, Binance US. Interesting. Interesting. One other, one other, one other question I have that's been in, in the news recently, and it seems like it's been going on since, gosh, I don't know, at least two or three years now is, is the, the Ripple case. Um, and my understanding is that this was, this is going to be a pivotal case depending on how it goes in that obviously it'll affect ripple a lot but in a dramatic way but it could have repercussions on the rest of the industry as well i've i've heard in the last few days that this has went from more of a 
uh, optimistic view from Ripple's perspective to uh, that maybe it's not going in their favor at this point. Do you do you have any insight or or no or can you explain how maybe even if you if maybe you don't want to get into the inside of the case in particular how how do you think the results of that would affect the rest of the of the industry? Yeah, well, if if XR, I mean, if it's, if XRP is declared a security, then that essentially is going to mean most altcoins are going to be declared securities, right? So it would sort of set some type of precedent there um, that anything remotely look anything that looks remotely like what XRP is is going to just be considered a security. If if it's come if it comes out and it's not a security, then that would probably you know that would probably bring a lot of at least in the short term, it might bring a lot more money back into the cryptoverse uh, because you wouldn't have to worry about that, but given everything that's happened recently right like it, it seems like it's the perfect storm it seems like it's the perfect storm to use all this sort of like as an excuse um and i i honestly don't really have much insight into the case i don't really i haven't really followed it that much there are one of the reasons i don't follow it that much is because it just takes place over years and years and right. years and and i remember back in 2020 when this started thinking like all right well hopefully it'll be over soon and now it's 3 years later almost well two and a half years later and and there there still hasn't really been anything on it. There is there's of course nuance as to what what could happen. I mean, you know, there could be a case, you know, that they they maybe say that XRP was a security when it launched, but maybe it transitioned into not being one at some point. That's probably the most optimistic view I think we could have right now. Um, I think the idea that it was just never one is probably a bit too too optimistic to think. Um but yeah, so it's it's probably it's probably either going to be like it was a security and then it transitioned into not being one, or it's just a security and it still is a security. And if it is a security, what I, I, I the issue with that is that a lot of the you know a lot of the exchanges in the United States that that you know that hold you know that that allow trading of these altcoins, they're not all you know regulated to sell securities to buy you know to 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 facilitate you know, tra security transactions or not. And so what you could see is exactly what happened when the SEC sued XRP or sued Ripple is a lot of the American based companies delisted XRP because, you know, what if it's a security? So imagine that, but imagine it for the entire altcoin market, right? So, so, so that that's another reason why I think you're seeing the altcoin market bleed back to Bitcoin. It's because there's this flight to safety of look, Bitcoin's not a security, and and again, like Bitcoin can still go down. We we saw this, we've seen the same thing in 2018 and 2019. Bitcoin dominance goes up when Bitcoin rallies, but then when Bitcoin comes back down, the dominance continues to go higher because Bitcoin was that flight to safety. But once the liquidity dries up from the altcoin market, then you can see Bitcoin USD come down. Um, and then I I think that. It's going to be a difficult. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a very difficult year for for crypto in general. Uh, I know everyone's happy right now because Bitcoin <laughs> is uh, is going up, but I think there's also a lot of people that are hurting because the altcoin market isn't really going up in the same way, you know. And and a lot of these altcoins are just putting in new low after new low after new low, and and it's it's really hurting a lot of people. And and so you could this this could be an artifact of of that flight to safety because as you said maybe maybe the news from the uh, Ripple case isn't going to be so um so positive yeah yeah before before we before we wrap up I you know you're you're somebody that I just I love your perspective on on all this because it's so uh, rational <laughs> which is not okay. often often the case especially in uh, when when people in fact you know it's it's interesting I, I know that you're you're on on his show as well occasionally so uh, it's it's really you and and guy uh, over at Corn Bureau are the two that I really rely on um, and and your analysis you know guy you can kind of listen to his uh, episodes and, 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 and videos and whatnot, but yours, you really want to, I really liked paying attention to because you really break out the graphs and you can really kind of understand. I know everybody probably doesn't think it's visually so exciting as all the little pop-ups that some of the other guys have, but I find it very informative. So I, I it's pretty boring. I think for a lot of people, I actually guy guys, the coin bureau channel is they, they, they also do more fundamental analysis. Sure. Uh, you know, like talking, which is not something I spent a lot of time talking about. I mean, I'll talk more about it on like, you know, like, like streams with you, right. Sure. Videos with you. But I don't typically just like open up my computer and say, all right, we're going to talk about the fundamental analysis <laughs> of Ethereum today, right? I have like one video 
on my channel or it's called like what is ethereum where we go into the fundamentals but for the most part that's not really my style yeah um my my stuff is is very speculative. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I have a deep appreciation of it. Um, but before we before we we wrap up here, I wanted to to ask you, you know, given your perspective and given your experience in the markets, like what is something that people or someone like myself who's kind of a novice should be ex, might expect to see coming from the crypto markets in the next, you know couple years maybe it's a, a, a i'm not necessarily asking for like oh bitcoin's going to shoot up to this or that kind of pr prediction maybe it's a technology maybe it's a development with regulations but just from your perspective what's something that the average person might not really be uh anticipating that that they might see happen in the next couple of years so from a price-based perspective Bef you know, sometime between now and the next halving, uh, which is probably going to be like, you know, Q1 of 2024. So a year from now, um, I think there's going to be a, a scare, like a, a, a high volatility event. And I think it's going to wipe out a lot of the value. That's my guess, right? It's a, but it's also based on every, you know, what we've seen every single cycle, right? I mean, we right. had, we had the same thing happen in 2020 and in 2015. And I, I think that same thing's going to happen again. And the issue is that it's probably going to scare a lot of people away just at the worst possible time. So from a price-based perspective, the bull case for Bitcoin is there. Like it's there. The, the issue that you're going to come into this year is that the liquidity is not there because we're, we're in QT and we're in a phase of, of higher interest rates. But eventually the Fed is going to, they're, they're going to have to pivot, right? Eventually, and whether it's late this year, early next year, I don't know when it's going to be. So I would say, try not to lose sight of that. Try not to lose sight of, of the eventual um, pivot back to looser monetary policy. And, and also, don't be surprised if over the next three to six months, you see the altcoins can still devalue against Bitcoin. That doesn't mean that the altcoin market is dead. It, it just means that it's going to, you know, the next time it gets built back up, hopefully it'll be with, with stronger projects. From a, you know, from a longer term price perspective, I think that um, in order for us to see new highs, across the cryptoverse i think we actually need real utility and you know more utility in the space than we currently have if you look at at the dot com crash it took real utility to to send it to new highs i mean think about what we have today right i mean i'm i'm on a macbook pro right now and and you know i i you, we can't i can't imagine my life without without these tech companies to be completely honest right i mean i, I use microsoft word or you know excel all these th all these sort of things i mean this is just like a, a thing that i it's sort of like a everything everyday part of our life i would say that there has to be some form of utility i think um to to really send the cryptoverse as a whole to new highs now bitcoin i think could be outside of that i, I think bitcoin bitcoin's bull case I think already exists. Like, I don't think it needs anything else specific to, to go on a bull run other than looser monetary policy. I think that's really all it needs. Um, from the altcoin market, I think you're going to have to look for utility. The main mistake, though, that I think the cryptoverse has made so far is that what you essentially have and what we've had for several years are crypto people, right? As a risk of sounding... Um, in a certain way, like as you mentioned, right, crypto bros. Uh, <laughs> there, right? Um, you have crypto people uh, doing things outside of their expertise and incorporating crypto into it. Um, so, like you know, like you've seen people create, you've seen crypto people create games and then incorporate crypto into the game. But then when you go play the game, it's a really crappy game because they don't know what they're doing. You know, they just want to incorporate it into something, uh, crypto into this stuff. So what you really need to see is you need to see these other industries incorporate crypto, right? Like you need to see the gaming interest, the, the gaming industry that's already an expert at gaming incorporate crypto. Um, like, you know, like Meta, uh, Facebook, you know, building the metaverse. Like you need to see that kind of stuff to continue. And, you know, if it does, then I, I and, and I, I think it will, is I, I want to say, I, I do think you're going to see crypto continue to grow, but that's ultimately, I think what's going to lead us to um, sort of the next paradigm shift in crypto. And I, I think that historic, we just spent a decade um, basically just speculating on crypto and not, and frequently not having any real world utility. 
But with higher uh, with a higher interest rate environment, which is arguably what we're going to be in for a while, I don't think they're going to be going back to you know 0.25 percent anytime soon because they would risk inflation coming back. Um, it doesn't mean they can't go back down to three to four percent, but you know, in general, with a higher interest rate environment and with access to uh, capital that isn't as cheap, people are going to be more stingy with their money. And and in order to get that money, you have to create a product that actually provides that utility. So. I don't know exactly what that utility is going to be. I, I, I think you could also see NFTs incorporated uh, in a way that's a bit more serious than just like JPEGs, you know, like whether it's like tickets to events or um, ownership of various stuff. I like, I'm not really an expert on the NFT world and I, I haven't really gone into it that much. I do think there's some untapped potential there far beyond you know, just buying a JPEG or, you know, something on, on the screen that sort of gets laughed at. But I think there's, there's some, there's something beyond that that can be obtained um, by people who just want to, you know, by people who want to, uh, to build. So I would just try to keep an eye out for the next, you know, the, the thing that actually provides value, uh, not just, Hey, we're going to create another, another dog coin, you know, and, and, um, and, and, and market it because that's what it is. I mean, that's what, Unfortunately, that's what crypto has become, right? It's basically a lot of people, they create a meme coin, they pay some influencer to market it, and then they they rug everyone who buys it. And it, and it sucks, but it, it just keeps on happening over and over and over again. So we need to try to transition away from that to, to, to more serious stuff. Um, I wish I had a better answer as to what the, you know, what the actual, unfortunately, I don't know. And, um, you know, if you you know, in like 2018 or 2019, like what would have been the next uh, catalyst for the bull run. Like I, FTs were going to be the, you know, one of the big things that took off. Like I would have had no idea that would have been, that would have been it. I don't know what it's going to be, but whatever it's going to be, I, I think hopefully will pop up within the next, you know, couple of years or so. Yeah. Well, you make me feel a little better because I've been a staunch believer uh, to not invest in anything that doesn't have a practical utility or application to it and to avoid all the meme meme stuff out there. So that makes, uh, makes me feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm somewhat on the right path. And I'll admit well, NF are. NFTs are something I, I do not understand in their current form. I, I, I don't disagree that there's probably some sort of use for them, but I just, I have not seen the value in them at this point. I, I don't know really what, 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 what to do with them at, at this point. Um, do you see maybe the, the advancements, you know, I, I, in, with like AI and, and maybe, you know, those kind of things. I know chat GPs come out and got a lot of people excited about the AI development. Do you, do you foresee uh, those things maybe coming into play in helping provide that utility potentially to crypto? Maybe. Um, but I could also see AI being, you know, something separate as well. Like, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to incorporate crypto. Sure. In it. Uh, but I do imagine that there will be crypto companies that, do incorporate um, AI into into their products, and, and and maybe that maybe that is you know the next the next thing. But you could probably get exposure to AI by other means other than crypto. You yeah. know, yeah. like you could get exposure to it. I mean, I have to imagine that Google is is um, working diligently to make sure they they retain as much market share as they can because I don't think they want to just lose it to chat to this new this new bot or not the new bot but the new AI, the Chat GPT. Um, Chat GPT. So I, I don't know. I mean, I I think that yeah, there's some element of um yeah, like you could be right. There there we could see some type of interconnectedness between AI and crypto. Um, but you know whether that whether that's actually the catalyst or not, I think remains to be seen. I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think one of the biggest catalysts is just going to be like, hey, like you know the U S dollar is just going to be debased now. And, and, you know, the, the feds going back to QE, are you just going to sit in USD and, and watch your purchasing power be inflated away? Or do you want to go to something that they can't just print out of thin air and go to Bitcoin? So I think that's probably the bull case for Bitcoin. Um, the bull case for everything else is, is kind of hit or miss. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I, uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here today and, and chatting with me. This has been a, a real pleasure, a real honor for me, for somebody who's, who's watched you for, for many hours. Um, tell everybody that doesn't know where they can find you, where they can find you online and, and become more informed on this topic. 
Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel. Uh, just my name, Benjamin Cowan. So you can check it out. Um, I'm going to have a Twitter as well, but uh, the Twitter is more uh, me just sort of goofing off and not really being as serious. So I would say just follow me on YouTube. And I, I normally put out like one video a day talking about something or another. Yeah. And uh, he didn't say it, but it's into the crypto verse for for all the all of you out there. If you if you don't uh, if you don't want to search for Ben, just into the crypto verse, we'll we'll definitely get you there and uh, we'll open up a world of, of information for you. So, again, appreciate it so much. It's It's been a real pleasure.